bunch of things, including being a uh, lawyer that scales supervisor who recently graduated. Well done, Laura. Okay. Great. Is that a applause for Laura, right? Not for not for me. Uh, great. Thanks for coming. Um, and thanks for being guinea pigs for a new talk uh, with a whole bunch of stuff I've not attempted to present before. So it'll be interesting to see what you think of it. I'll try and get through it at a decent pace so that there's time for you to tell me why um, you thought you know, bits of it could be clearer or better or uh, maybe more sense to you. So I'm open to a bit of discussion. Um, I've got really into navel gazing recently or reflexivity, if you want to be academic about it. Um, it's interesting to, to be back. I think the last talk I gave at UCLIC was in this room. Um, and it was a long time ago. Uh, it was seven years ago. Um, and there was also about measurement. Uh, this talk was about uh, getting people uh, as sensors and then IoT sensors and all these kind of things. I did nothing with this talk. I, nothing happened with it. Um, so maybe this will go the same way. I don't know. But it's, it's nice to be back and to carry on, to pick up a thread. That I, I last finished talking about. So what am I going to cover in this talk? Um, I'm going to say why I think it's worth spending time talking about measurement, which seems something that is so obvious and intrinsic that it maybe doesn't require talking about. What I'm going to try and do then is talk about how I have attempted to measure things in my research. Um, and things that I thought went have gone well and things that in retrospect being uh, candid and critical about them maybe could, could have gone better. Um, then I'll kind of get onto some kind of disciplinary norms about how we choose what we measure, why we choose to measure the things that we measure and then finish off with kind of like how is the world outside of our academic environments or even industrial research environments, how does that influence um, our practice. So we obviously we don't exist as kind of monolithic, um, hello, monolithic kind of people uh, independent of the world at large. So I'll finish off by thinking about speculating. There's a lot of speculation in this talk, uh, speculating on kind of maybe some of the ways that we do research and how they might be influenced by what's happening in the world at large. So when I say the talks about measurement, it's not about quantification. It's important to say that this talk is not about how to find numbers for uh, recording observations of certain phenomena. It, it's not about that. It's just about measurement in the broadest uh, sense of it. So interviews are a form of measurement, right? You go and talk to some people about something that's still a kind of measurement. It's not quantified. You're not going to have a you know the number of times they use a noun or whatever but it, it's still a form of measurement. So this is not about talking about the quantification um, of our research. It's about how we do measurement, whether we're doing uh, participatory design or we are doing psychology, cognitive science experiments or whatever. It's any kind of empirical work. Um, so all kind of empirical research in human-centered computing. Not all human-centered computing research is empirical. Not all of it involves having observations about the world. But most of it does. If you go through a CHI proceedings, most of it has some kind of empirical component. And the kind of set of things that I'm talking about in this talk is all of those things. So obviously, when I talk about my own work, my own work is like a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of all the different ways you could try and measure things. Again, this maybe this is kind of telling you all to suck eggs. I mean, you all know how to do research. Um, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about measurement the last few years. It's a really important part of what constitutes our contribution to knowledge. So sometimes you might make method, methodological contribution in your work. There might be a certain developing a certain measure, um, but also the extent, the kind of uh, the power of the contributions that we can make with our work is significantly tied to what we measured, how we were able to measure it, and whether we did a good job of that. So hopefully familiar with the idea of construct validity. Um, construct validity is the extent often there are things out in the world that we want to measure but they're immeasurable um, you know there are certain things about how people think that you can't find even if you cut into their brains and put probes in there you couldn't do that obviously for ethical reasons but you still couldn't find out the things you wanted from inside someone's head by cutting their head open and looking at it um, so always when we're doing any kind of empirical investigations 
we are trying to measure something that we may not be able to measure, and instead we measure something, some proxy of it or something, you know. So when we try and measure attitudes, we might develop a scale or inventory that asks people a bunch of questions. We can't actually measure the attitudes. What we can measure is a proxy of that using some sort of scale and scale or inventory. Um, the actual phenomenon is not accessible to us with, with any measures that we, we have. So we develop these proxies um, and use those instead. And that construct validity is the gap between the thing that we are able to measure um, and the thing we would really like to measure. So hopefully this is all stuff that's familiar to you when you, you think about in, in your own work. So we, but there, there are limitations on what we can measure. And I'll talk about some of the, why we have some of those limitations as the talk goes on. One of the main things I want to talk about is the fact that the gap between, so sometimes there's a gap between what we can, um, what we can measure and what we want to measure. And we go like, we maximize completely a kind of scientific utility. So like something like the Large Hadron Collider is a spend all the money we have to try and get as close as possible um, to measuring the thing that we really want to measure. Right, to minimize that construct validity. They go kind of go all out on that. They don't make that many compromises. Um, unfortunately, not all of us have like tens of billions of pounds supporting us. And so the decisions we make about what we measure are usually a lot more constrained. So we can't often measure the thing that we want to measure. Can't measure the thing we want to measure because it's not measurable. And we often can't measure the proxy thing that we'd really like to be able to measure because there are resource constraints or ethical constraints. Um, there are other constraints on us that prevent us from, from measuring the thing that first proxy measure. And so, so instead, we're left with measuring this kind of second order proxy measure, which is we can't get to the proxy measure because reality gets in the way of it, which is itself one step removed from the actual phenomenon that we really want to measure in our research. OK, let's try and make this a bit more concrete rather than uh, me whispering on. Uh, so to make this kind of discussion, these kind of constraints on this gap in our construct validity, the gap between the thing that we really we were able to measure and the thing that we really wanted to be able to measure. I'm gonna look at some of my own work um, uh, to think about what kind of stopped me in that work achieving a better construct validity, a better match, a closer match to the, the actual phenomenon um, I wanted to measure. Why did I end up having to compromise? Um, and, you know, what were those compromises and how did I make decisions about those? And I've intentionally chosen work that I led on to do this. Um, partly because I have a great insight into the, the actual decisions that were made and those compromises. Um, but also, it's kind of a bit, a bit, a bit of scab picking, maybe. And so it's better to do that with work you led on than, than work your colleagues led on, um, so you don't end up falling out with any, anyone. So the, the ones I've chosen are ones um, that I've led on, and therefore I bear the main responsibility for the compromises that were made um, in, in, in the research. So here's the first one. This is uh, about in making inferences about interruptions. Um, this is a paper from 2016. Um, so it's quite a long time ago. Uh, <clears throat> and the question, the essential question of the paper is how do people doing online crowd work interleave their various tasks? So crowd workers, they make money by doing lots of small tasks. Um, to make any real money on that platform, you have to do lots of different things. You have to be watching what's coming on, what stuff you've got on your stack you have to do. And so it's quite a busy task, um, uh, monitoring all these different things. You end up switching between tasks quite a lot. So this came out of work that I was doing on interruptions already. And this paper was kind of torture, <laughs> completely torturous. I think it's important to have this kind of higher level context of this kind of uh, uh, practice of, of producing some of this stuff. Um, so I think this work would have been done, this work was done with a PhD student, I'm guessing the work would be done at the end of 2013, and then it went through, the, the, the system can't handle the number of revision cycles of revision this paper went through, so it just gives you the initial submission date and then when it was finally accepted. So it was a bit of a torturous process um, uh, getting the paper out. What happens uh, in this work is that people can complete a routine task where they type some things into some some things into boxes it doesn't really matter the task doesn't do anything but they type things into boxes and every now and again they get interrupted and one of the things that uh, I was interested in, in the paper was when people uh, seemed like they were getting interrupted as they were working on this quite boring tedious task and because they get interrupted because they've got other tasks to do they've got to try to make as much money as possible and to do that um 
we used inferences. So we couldn't measure if people were switching to other tasks because they were on the end of a phone line somewhere on another continent. Um, we didn't have any insight, you know, local insight into what they were doing or why. Um, and so instead, what the task did was monitor some browser events to make inferences. So if the task got left for a long period of time, um, this would this would start to stack up. So you know, when people are working through this task, if they pause for a long time between maybe doing this one and doing this one, we make a guess that that was a very long period. They spent 15 seconds from going from, from this task to this task. They probably were doing something else rather than staring at the screen for 15 seconds, not doing anything at all. They might have been. They might have been. We don't know. Um, and using that data, you've able to put together this kind of thing. So you can see from this about four seconds when you finish one part of this task, you move to the next one, it takes about four seconds to move. So the people who are taking 40 seconds, probably not working on the task, probably got distracted by something else. But we don't know because all we could tell was when people stopped working on our task, we didn't know what they did, where they, what else they were working on. Nothing outside of our task was observable to us. And so why, you know, why, basically why, why make the guess? Why limit yourself to, to having a guess? Why not try and find out what they were doing rather than just guessing and make an inference about, okay, there is something here. I don't know what it is, but it's a long time. And so they're probably not doing what I expect them to do. And, and even at that, why, why, why kind of settle for that kind of explanation, which is kind of a little bit unsatisfying. This is one of the reasons that reviewers took so long to accept the paper because they, they, they also found this kind of inference to be, oh, somewhat unsatisfying, don't end show. Um, they found this inference to be somewhat unsatisfying as well. Um, so constraints. So, so why why did I measure this thing? So ideally, the kind of um, the true phenomenon is what were people doing on their computers and switching tasks. So if I stood over them, but I was invisible and they didn't know I was there, then I could have got closer to the true phenomenon because I could have watched them at work. I could have watched what they were looking at. I could have watched how they move between the applications. I could have watched when they got up from their desk and went to answer the door or or whatever people are doing in this in, in this super long tail. You know, whatever people are doing down here, at, you know, 380 seconds, I, I could have just watched them. So that's the true phenomenon that I, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a fancy world, I could have monitored. Obviously got nowhere near, nowhere near that, right? This is nowhere near that. This is just the best guess. Uh, it's uh, it's a just purely purely an inference. So why did I settle on that? Why not do a better job of it? Like, why not try and get closer to that ideal? Even if the ideal is impossible, why settle for this, this difference? So uh, one is ethical. Um, so there's a kind of obligation that's incumbent on us when we're doing research not to collect vast amounts of data that we don't need. Um, and at the point of uh, uh, designing the study, we weren't actually sure what measures were going to be most useful. So we could have collected more invasive data, but would that have told us more about this phenomenon? Unknown at that point. So would it be ethical to collect vast amounts of data that we didn't know was going to be useful or have any kind of explanatory power? Um, that's like a really simple one, which is that I did this research while I was doing my PhD and this was not my PhD research. Um, like that matters, right? I didn't have five years to go build whatever system or invisibility cloak would have been required to do this research exactly as I wanted. And I was a PhD student doing it as like a side project. And that had resource constraints on my time. Um, like that was a material consideration. Like it's not, that's not a scientific consideration, of course. That's not about, you know, good science or anything like that. That's a human, you know, it's a human constraint or limitation, which was, I didn't have time or resources to do something better. Like that's, uh, you know, which is, and, and these, these things matter. These things matter in, in, in thinking about how the how research works out because it's it's rarely perfect um, and there are always compromises. And I think one of the things I've been interested in the last few years is interrogating those compromises and working out which compromises are acceptable and which ones are not. So this compromise, I'm like completely comfortable with it. Would the paper have been better if this paper had been the product of a, Three year postdoc where I was just working on this project. Um, you know, it, this, this, I'm, I'm very comfortable with this as a compromise because I couldn't have done anything different at the time. There wasn't a better option. That was just the, the situation I was in when I was trying to do this research. 
there are logistic um, uh, logistical, not logistic, not regressions, um, logistic, uh, logistical challenges of deploying outside the browser as well. So if I built a tool that could have been, been done some more invasive monitoring and recording and maybe got me closer to that ideal scenario of being the, the invisible fairy on the shoulder, um, could have done that, but that would have been logistically challenging to produce the software, to get participants to put it onto their machine, convince them to do that, maybe some ethical concerns about that as well. Do you want to install some spyware on your computer to participate in my study? Hmm. Um, so that would have been difficult as well. It's not impossible. This could be done, but this comes again back to these resource constraints as well. So there's a logistical challenge of trying to deploy. So the software we used was only in the browser, all ran in the browser. That's kind of easy. They navigate through a web page, you get the data. You don't have to ask them to do anything or administer anything or control anything. So that's hard. So couldn't kind of couldn't really solve that, especially not with the the limited time. So that then became a constraint as well. And then there's kind of epistemological constraint still, where if I had maybe built some sophisticated surveillance software to do it, still couldn't have been the fairy, right? So I've still have fallen short because when the people get up and go here, if this is you know over here at, at five minutes, if that's them going up to feed their cat or whatever, I still couldn't have observed that. So even if I had done a lot of engineering say to build something that was much more sophisticated in terms of what it could measure i still would not have been able to measure i was still being far away from the actual phenomenon that i want to measure there's a whole load of so it's really making inferences right so you know as it was i made a bunch of inferences on kind of sparse data and if i had built something that was more sophisticated i still would be making a whole bunch of inferences on sparse data so then the question is with the inferences on the somewhat less sparse data, would, would they have been much better than the, the inferences I made on the on the more sparse data? I don't know, it's not possible to say because you know, didn't run the didn't run, run the other study. What would an alternative be? Maybe build a browser plugin. Um, like I said, and people have done this for, for studying workers in this context, these crowd workers built browser plugins. Um but then there's that, that trade-off. So you've got the you've got the logistical challenges. You know, you've got the difficulty of building this tool, the resources of building the tool. Is it going to work on all the different computers? Is it going to collect the kind of data you need? Um, you get more granular data, but <coughs> excuse me, is that trade-off worth it? Would you learn more? Would 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 we have found out more if it had a browser plugin that told me which windows they went to rather than the fact they just left the task for some period of time? Maybe, maybe, maybe the study would have been better if we'd done that. I don't know. Um, so you can't. So where, where does it go? You, you're stuck inside the browser. So you what, build a desktop application. Maybe you build a rootkit that can monitor all events that happen on the computer, ignoring the ethical concerns and the logistical concerns and all the other concerns about that. But then that still doesn't tell you when they leave. So do you then get a webcam data? Do you, do you, do you say you also need to record their, their video as well? At what point? Do you say the, the you know the it's marginal marginal returns right? You could you could do all these things. None of this is impossible, all right? So I can't become the invisible fairy on their shoulder watching them, but I could build this thing. Well, maybe not me, but somebody could. Somebody could build this thing. Would it have got them closer to understanding the phenomenon of people switching away from tasks? Would they have got closer to it? Would the trade-offs have been worth it? I don't have an answer to this question, by the way, because I didn't run the other studies. So this is the kind of questions that reviewers ask when they look at our work and they say, well, you could have done this instead. And you think, well, I didn't. So, you know, do you want the paper or not? Um, and so when we're thinking about measurement, we've got these, all these constraints. All these constraints then also, they're mapped against the actual scientific questions of like, what do we need to know? So we're managing the kind of the fact we can't do the things we want to do, but at the same time, are the costs of getting closer? It's kind of asymptotic, right? You get diminishing returns on the effort here. Would you get any closer to the question? Would you would you be better off for the extra ten thousand hours to make this happen? Would you have been able to better answer the question? I don't know. So I there is no answer to this. I'm just think about your own research. What could you have? taken from that and how much work would it have been to make it slightly better and would they have actually changed the outcome these questions you can't answer them they're just just ones to kind of ponder and think about reflexivity um 
Here's another one. Um, just to show you, I've not really learned anything in, in the intervening years. This one is a paper from this year. Um, what happens when digital services close down? Um, you know, ones you rely on, what happens if they, they close down? Um, and it's a survey with qualitative analysis. So the last one was a quantitative collection numbers thing, and this was a zero survey and then do a qual analysis of the, of the survey responses. What are the constraints on this one? So there's an ethical constraint. So it would have been uh, any kind of hypothesis testing would have been kind of questionable here. So we didn't, this is a very exploratory study. There's not really any, there wasn't really much research on this or there isn't much research on this. So it's very difficult to formulate any kind of hypotheses to test, for example. Um, so going and doing hypothesis testing when you have no idea what you might find or why you're doing it, maybe there are ethical concerns about that. You set people up in experiments, even though you've no idea what's going to happen. Again, that comes into the collecting random data. Uh, is, it, is it defensible? Resource constraints, an opportunity sample. So I had the people who participated with the people who self-selected themselves to participate. Like I didn't have a, I had some budget for a kind of prize raffle for this, but I couldn't pay all the participants 50 quid to respond. And there were uh, protocol reasons why I didn't want that to happen. I didn't want to kind of incentivize people to, participate for the sake of participating. I wanted people who were interested to participate. So that's a, that was a resource constraint as well. And there's a logistical constraint, which is this was spare time research. So not PhD student anymore, but this was like, not it's not a research grant. This was just an idea that I had and I started working on it. So that's a constraint. I have even less time than I was a PhD student. So it's an even bigger constraint um, than it would have been um, uh, a decade ago. And then, yeah, this comes back to the kind of ethical as well, is that it's just too limited in terms of the knowledge of the context to be able to kind of operationalize measures of something in this context of like positive attitude or negative attitude or anything like that. We just didn't know enough about how people deal with this phenomenon of the scenario to be able to operationalize some kind of measurement of how they feel or what they do or how they think. We just didn't have enough context to be able to do that. Um, so normally... I, I know this is often frowned on, but this is a short excerpt. I'm not going to complain about the review at all, but I just, this is really interesting. It's completely relevant. I just find it really interesting. So one of the things that we did, because there's an opportunity sample, uh, some people might have had an experience of having stuff they've used and just kind of die on them and be taken away. And some people who were like, oh, this is interesting. I'm going to participate may not have had that experience. So in the cases where people had not had that experience, we asked them to speculate because we had an opportunity sample and we weren't going to turn away half the people who turned up and say, I'm interested in your study, but I've not experienced that. And no, you can't participate then. I mean, you might do that. You know, there are psychology studies, for example, that set up in that way. Like you are not eligible to participate. You do not have correct vision. You may not participate. Um, but given an opportunity sample for a spare time research project, I wasn't going to be like, no, you can't participate. I'll just, you know, you, know, you can't do it. Um, so I was like, yeah, you can participate and just, you can speculate, right? If you've experienced it, tell us what happened. And if you can't, then just speculate. And one of the reviewers was, just, was really, really mad about this. They were not happy at all. Um, so they said, um, so asking people to imagine things is like a pretty standard HDI research practice. Like there are loads of methods that ask participants to think about or speculate on or imagine that. So like, it was a bit of an odd comment to get because it's like in the final paper, which we published, there's like now like 20 citations, the random papers where they ask people to imagine to do things. But um, what was interesting to me, anyway, the reason why I included this is not just of a gripe about it is because what I found it interesting is that the comment, this is not a valid approach was, was really interesting to me. Um, so it's a kind of form of measurement, right? you're measuring people's, the attempt is to measure people's speculations about what they think would happen. Um, this is not a valid approach. So that was really interesting. So I think so far I've talked about the construct validity as being a gap, which can be our variable, variable size. Sometimes we're very far away from the phenomenon we want. Sometimes we're quite close, but I generally don't think of it as like a binary thing. Like this is not a valid approach. Like, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could have construct validity of zero, which would be not a valid approach. But I kind of, it's an odd, I, I find it an odd comment anyway, um, to say it's not a valid approach. Um, 
especially then matched up as a more valid approach. Now, oh, this died. Oh, they're all out of order. What's happened to all my highlighting? Um, the, the, the reviewer then said a more valid approach, which is interesting because if it's not a valid approach at all, something more valid than not valid would still not be valid. Um, so I do, try and deconstruct reviews like this. It's interesting. Um, oh, it is working. I just, that screen's so dirty, I can't see it. Okay. Um, so a more valid approach would have been to ask participants to remove an app, blah, blah, blah. Um, another measurement thing, for any length of time, so if I'm in particular, a time of zero, does that mean a time of zero would be something we could measure here? Um, uh, to consider how this made them feel. So I, I, I mean, the reason why I, I took this quote and the reason why I, I mulled on this and thought about it was because it comes down to the core of what the paper is trying to do, which is just attempt to measure some kind of phenomenon and hammock some kind of statements about it. And this is not an atypical review, right? You've probably, if you send papers review, you've had this experience. You send it and they say, oh, you shouldn't have done that study. You should have done this other study. I mean, I've written that review myself. Your study was terrible. You should have done the one I just thought of um, in the last five minutes without considering any constraints you've got on you um, when you're trying to uh, formulate your, your research protocol. Um, but I thought it was, it was I, I just thought it was really interesting in terms of thinking about what I'd attempted to measure. And then, well, one being told that that was just not valid, which was, like I said, it's kind of like a less valid, or, you know, there are better ways for sure, but not valid, I thought was quite a strong statement about how things could be measured in this context, especially because it's exploratory research, right? There's no kind of established protocol for, for, for examining this phenomenon. Um, but then the suggestion was to measure something for any length of time um, and consider how this made them feel. So it's a, a kind of, okay, let's, let's try this. Let's try R2's. Or two, I don't know if they're R2. It doesn't, yeah. I, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm not mad about it. The paper got published. It's fine. I, I just find it really interesting. So let's imagine um, we did what they said. But what they're proposing is basically a digital detox study, you know, where you get people to turn off apps and you see, you know, my mental health was way better when I turned off Facebook or my phone. Right, this is that's kind of study that people have done. There, there's quite a few of these. But clearly that's not the same thing. So that wouldn't, remotely measure the same thing as you're in the middle of using a family photo sharing service that suddenly is turned off. Like it, it's not, not the construct validity there doesn't map because the kind of proposed target phenomenon here is not the one we're interested in measuring in the, in the study. This, this is about how, if you turn off apps, how people feel then that's not the same thing as services closing down mid use. So it doesn't, doesn't map. So not really usable as an alternative. And then more value in what way? So what would the construct be and what is the phenomenon of interest? So, um, you know, this is, this is not just a different study in that it's a different way of finding, a better way of finding the same thing. This is a different study in the sense that this measures a completely different thing. The construct, you know, the construct validity here and the questions about what this measures and what this would tell us, this is not a better study. It's not a more valid approach. It's a completely different approach that answers a completely different scientific question. Not the same thing at all. Um, and then what is a valid approach to collecting opinions anyway? I mean, what, what, could anyone circumscribe that to me? Like what, what are the limits when you're collecting something like an opinion where you, you, can't, you, you can't achieve complete construct validity. You can't measure an opinion, not, not the opinion itself because the opinions are weird firing patterns in our brains that are not measurable with any of our current scientific or technological tools. So what would be a, what's a valid or invalid approach for collecting opinion? Yeah, there are definitely ways, ones that will get closer to measuring the thing that you want to measure, but there's what could be valid or invalid about collecting opinions. So we have these constraints and then we go to reviewers and they give us other ideas which themselves have their own constraints, their own problems. So could have measured some better, maybe could have the better construct validity um, for that study. I don't know. I, I didn't get to run the other study. None of us do. So um, last one. Some of you will have participated in the study. Um, this was a, a 2016 paper, so back in time again. Um, and uh, you know the short links, like a bitly link or whatever. 
they're hard to type on smartphones. Um, I had this realization looking at a Kai 2015 program. Um, so how could you design those links so they were easier to type on a phone? That's what this paper is about. Uh, did some Monte Carlo modeling, and there was an experiment that ran a phone browser. And folks, you click down in the fishbowl, they I put things up on a screen, and they typed on their phone. Who in the room participated? Yeah. <laughs> um, so you got live participant experience. So uh, you type these random things. So it's kind of a bit of a weird experiment. So what are the constraints on what we can measure here? Uh, so ethical. So one way of doing this, one constraint we kind of put on ourselves was not to develop a, a kind of a drop in. So one way you could do is we develop a drop in replacement keyboard, which could take all the keystrokes. Obviously, hey, do you want to participate in my weird study in the fishbowl? All you need to do is download this program that lets me collect everything you type on your phone keyboard. Right. So I didn't go there. So that was an immediate constraint on, on the kind of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the kind of the granularity of the measures we could have. Guess what? This is also a random side project. <laughs> there's, a, there's a trend here. I don't know when I get to present the actual research that's not a random side project. Um, so building custom keyboards was too much. Like I didn't have the time or resources to go away and build Android and iOS custom keyboards that were all instrumented to collect all this data anyway. So even if it was ethical, I didn't have the time to do it. Right? Didn't have the resources to do it. Logistical. Um, there's another constraint, which was it, it was gamified. So the idea was that in order to encourage participants to try and type these things as quickly as possible, um, which would give us a kind of floor for the or ceiling for the, the speed accuracy, it was gamified. So the people were competing against each other. So whoever could um, type these things fastest would, would win. And uh, there wasn't any prizes apart from being on a leaderboard. It's a leaderboard. So you could win by being the top of the leaderboard. I literally printed out leaderboards and stuck them on the door. Um, but this requires synchronous group sessions. So I had to get people in the room at the same time and do this weird little task. So that was a constraint as well. So that limited how much data I could collect, a variety of different participants, because I, again, without resources for a random side project, I, I couldn't go and maybe hire a room and then recruit, you know, a kind of stratified sample and get people in and give this a go. So basically people at Euclid participate in the study. Um, and yeah, again, the kind of in terms of, uh, of knowledge didn't have any about kind of optimization strategies. So it was difficult to justify building more complex instrumentation or more complex measures because didn't really know what people were going to do with this, didn't know how, how, how it might work. Um, I don't know, yeah, this was also, it's a resource intensive. Um, almost no one has read this paper. So as it turned out, it was the correct approach not to spend too much time on it. Um, and one of the things was uh, with this was that the reason I'm telling you about this, not just uh, randomly, once they typed it in, they were asked to rate, and you can't see it over here, but you can over this side of the room. So apologies to this side of the room. There's a slide on the screen and it, you, you used it to, to say how hard or easy you found it. So if you find it hard, you slid it to the right. And if you find it easy, you slid it to the left. And what are the participants? And this is uh, the thing about doing, <laughs> doing research on your research colleagues um, is that they often have opinions about your research. And uh, one of the participants mentioned, they, they basically thought this thing could not measure anything about the subjective experience. What's the experience? And I've basically been thinking about this ever since, even though nobody is basically nobody has read this paper. I still think about the comment from the participant, not in a kind of like, oh, I felt so bad. Kind of way. Just like I've just been trying to think like, well, yeah, you're kind of right. How would I what should I have measured? What would have given me a better insight into kind of the subjective experience of doing this task rather than this weird little slider? And the conclusion I came to was just don't do that. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't a, a better or magical option for doing that. Um, you know, the, the participants saying, you can't measure that thing like this. The logical answer is not to like do something that is more sophisticated or has some nice experience sampling things. You just don't measure that thing. Um, so we had all these behavioral measures. We had all these, you know, quantitative timing stuff. Why ask for this kind of subjective experiencing? What was the rationale for it? Um, how would it be useful in answering the research questions, which were much more about speed accuracy trade-offs than about subjective experiences of typing things. So why did I include it? I included it because I could, and that's it. Like really being super honest, at the end of the day, there was not a good scientific reason for putting the slider thing in. It's just that between these trials, I wanted people to have kind of something to do. And I thought, oh, I'm on more data. And if 
you know, reviewers complain about subjective experience. I'll have some data to say, oh, people find the hard ones hard and find the easy ones easy, which is in the paper. The modeling showed that. People find the hard ones hard and the easy ones easy. Like, it didn't really tell us anything at all. But it was in there because it could go in there. It fit on the page. If you take it away, it's just, well, that's all you get on the page. It doesn't look better when you've got this other stuff to do. It gives someone something to do with their thumb. There was not really a rationale for it. It was just in there because it could be in there. So, you know, the answer to the participant a decade later is like, no, it can't measure that subjective experience. I just shouldn't have done that. It didn't add anything to the scientific question. So there's not really an alternative. So, so sometimes the thing is just not to measure the thing because it's just a waste of time and irritates your participants. Okay, so I've got like five minutes left, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good, that's about what I need. Um, so that's like a critique of, like you can do this with your own work, I'm sure. Like it's not, I, I think it's just not me that's a complete failure in life. Like if we all dig through our papers and dig through, well, why did I do it like that? And you're like, I don't know. Like my supervisor told me I had to have a proposal ready for next week. And I said, I said, I'll measure that thing. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And that's what it was. There wasn't any more reason to it than that. So how do we decide what to measure then, right? So in this ideal world, you know, we, we kind of, uh, the, the, you know, the magical universe of science, we, we measure the thing that needs to be measured to get us to minimize our kind of, uh, to maximize our construct validity, to minimize that gap between the phenomenon we're interested in measuring and the thing we can measure. And we would just, as good scientists, we would just always seek to minimize that. Um, everything else is a distraction and all our science proceeds in that way. But of course, that's not how any of our research takes place. You know, and, and the philosophy of science research, like Latour did the studies of labs. And like, are they mythical places? No, it's just a job and a workplace. And the way we produce scientific research is pretty similar to how we produce cars or anything else with a few bells and whistles. But it's people in rooms talking about things and working on things that kind of, it's not magic, right? It, 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 it's human, it, it, they're all human constraints. So this kind of gap between what we measure and what we'd like to measure is sort of these kind of, I call them irrational. Um, and in, in this paper, I uh, published this last year, last year, um, I, I kind of qualify this. I don't mean irrational. Irrational is a really loaded term, but basically that gap between what we do decide to measure and the thing that we really want to measure is not just a, a limit on what is possible to measure. It also includes a whole bunch of other things like I was tired. Um, I didn't have any money left. My research contract was about to finish. I had to fill, complete my PhD and defend it. And all these things go into producing this gap between what we do actually end up measuring compared to what we would like to measure. It's not like a, you know, a purely util utility maximizing thing where you think, what would be the best measure we could possibly do? Because if we go back to our own, you know, all our research, you could probably always think of something you could have measured that would have got you closer to the actual phenomenon that you're interested in. It just would have cost you more effort or more money and you didn't have a postdoc or you, you, know, you had these other constraints or you just didn't know, you missed some papers that told you about it, right? These are all human things. It's not magic science, uh, special, you know, uh, the things that mean that we get a car that doesn't work properly, uh, breaks down after we buy it, brand new off the forecourt it's the same reason why sometimes we measure the thing that we this is a bit crap yeah so it, it it's not we don't exist our research doesn't exist in a kind of completely logical space like that one of the examples i i, I very quickly one of the examples i talk about in this paper is this fast data so many of these crowdsourcing platforms uh, offer research data really quickly this is like a thing like get your data now um how does being able to get the data now pose the gap between what we can measure and what we want to measure. How, how does getting the data really quickly, how does it improve, how does it improve our construct validity? Well, it doesn't, right? Being able to get it now or next week, it doesn't improve the, the science, the construct validity there. In the paper, I describe it as being part of a consumption experience. So the idea is that basically these companies want you to, to want to sell you a service and they advertise to you, just like Coca-Cola advertises to you. So Gorilla does, or, or Prolific does, and the way they, they, they market it to you is by convincing you that being able to get your data really quickly would be good, and you would feel good, just like if you go buy a nice ring and you'll feel good inside, and other people will think you're really good. Um, and it's the same thing. So we, there's no kind of, there's no rational scientific reason why getting the data now versus in 10 days' time would make any difference to the quality of the science. Instead, it's kind of like, oh, now, now it's good. Now it feels good. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to use this platform to get my data. 
So we're susceptible to advertising. Like we're not, again, we're not logical automatons doing research. Just like we're susceptible to advertising when we go home, we're susceptible to advertising when we do our work as well. We don't have like some sort of like Faraday cage that prevents these external influences controlling what we think. And then, you know, there are other, the, the other kinds of influences like publish or perish. So why would might want it quickly? Doesn't make you do better research, but you might be able to do more of it more quickly. And that would be good, not for scientific reasons, but it'd be good for your career because then you would have a very long list of very good papers and then people would want to hire you. That's not a scientific reason. It's got nothing to do with science. That's, that's an institutional organizational reason why you might choose to take this approach to measurement. Like there's no scientific defense for this. It's, this, is a, this is the way we, we structure our work. This is, this is like a labor relations thing, not a scientific thing. There's no reason to have loads and loads and loads of papers. And then finally, the thing that it all gets me thinking, thinking about is, you know, this paper focuses on ac academic research and how it happens. What about the kind of the, the world? How does that influence us? Influence us? So on-demand services, we used to, you go on a phone, you press the buttons and the food arrives at your house. We've kind of got used to that. Does that influence how we feel about how work should go? If it's, if we have these kind of services that press buttons and then stuff comes out that we want. I mean, Uber Eats and Amazon Mechan Mechanical Turk are kind of two sides of the same coin. Like one gives you food quickly, that gives you data quickly, and you don't need to worry what happens to make that happen. Instant connectivity of the internet. So imagine if you had to send your manuscripts for review after you typewritten them and you had to put them in a post and then they read in the post somewhere and then somebody had to read them on paper and then they maybe wrote on them and then they posted it back to you. How might that change the way you thought about measuring things or the level of thought you put in how you measure things? If you couldn't just press a button to submit your paper, then you get some email a few months later. Telling you, you know, if, it was, if it was much more effortful, so maybe you know, it's kind of instant connectivity we get from the internet that kind of influences all sorts of parts of our lives, maybe that also controls how we think about research and why we might think getting things faster is, is good. Same with commodification as well. So, you know, things that are, things that were considered sacred become part of the market, um, integrated into, into markets. Um, and that's basically what has been happening in universities for like the last 30 years. So, go back to publish or perish. We, these kind of influences on the structural conditions in which we work obviously affects uh, the way we think about um, what we measure and why we measure it. Last thing is how this kind of thinking about measurement outside of um, outside of research. So it's like super in vogue to measure um, measure work. Um, scientific management is very old, but all it's kind of the things that have come after scientific management, it's something I'm interested in my research. Um, scientific management is about using empirical methods to understand work, to be able to organize work in a way that is more profitable. And what is interesting is if you look at how people try and measure things in workplaces, it's like, again, the lab is not a sacred space. Basically, you see people in the workplaces trying to measure things and they encounter the same kind of constraints and challenges that we do in our own research, but with additional pressures like profit making, um, which is quite hard and satisfying. Um, and so what happens is that you get this kind of, uh, this desire to try and measure things all the time, because if we can measure more, we'll get closer to having cost validity. If only we could measure more, if only we could measure more. Um, and uh, I like to put this quote up, which is it's a made up story. Uh, it's a Borges made up story. I'm not going to read it because Anna will cut me off before the end. Um, but basically the idea is a fable and, and there's, a, there's an empire that likes making maps and eventually they end up wanting to get such specific maps, they end up with these one-to-one, -one, they make a map that is the size of the empire. So they just replicate the entire world again. And I feel like that's where we're going with measurement and with things like Metaverse and that kind of thing. Just trying to have a one-to-one -one replica of the entire world which is just not manageable and makes us make all sorts of bad decisions about how does it get us closer to the target phenomenon how does collecting all the data you can about someone at work how does it get us better to closer to understanding the target phenomenon which is their productivity no i answer most of the time to these things is it doesn't so going back to the short links just shouldn't have collected it don't collect all this kind of data um but there's an idea that if you collect if only could collect more if you could collect a bit more then you would get closer to the measuring the thing you want to measure. I just don't think that's true. Okay, 
So measuring things is really hard. Uh, we, have to, we have to use proxies. Hardly any of the things we want to measure, we can actually measure. Even physics, even large hadron colliders, they measure things by proxy. You can't actually see subatomic particles. You have to use methods that one step removed from it. Some work better than others. And they are always chosen because they work better. So we are constrained. Um, we are human beings trying to do uh, trying to do a job that hopefully we get paid for um, some of the time. And the choices we make aren't always in the necessary about optimizing the scientific contribution of things. There are other factors that influence it. And so what do we do about this? Why, why bother thinking about this at all um, rather than just navel gazing? Well, because we should pick at these things. And I think it's help, helpful to go back over stuff you've done and go, well, why did I do it like that? And be as honest as you can about the compromises you made about it. And some of those compromises you will be satisfied with. You'll be like, well, I couldn't have done better than that. That was the best I could do. And other compromises you might think were a bit like lazy compromises or whatever. It's a bit of a loaded word, but like I could have done better on that. I just didn't because I didn't want to. Um, so I think if we can go back and think about why we measured the things that we measured, it would help us then think about in the future how we might do a better job of choosing measures within the constraints that operate, uh, we operate under. So thanks for listening. Sorry for witching on uh, for longer than I'd hoped. And uh, thanks to the collaborators um, on the papers I've talked about. Um, they weren't responsible for any of the terrible decisions. <laughs> All right, thanks. Do you pass it around? Oh, no, I need it to answer the question. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I can do the other. Hi. Um, that's really interesting. And I have a lot of comments. If you're interested, we can yeah. set on some, some, some time for yeah. like offline. But two um, quick ones. Um, one on the data speed, yeah. the fast data kind of thing. I see all the arguments you, you put forward, but. Yeah. I also think that very closely related to what you said earlier in the talk, the yeah. factor is that if it takes you 10 minutes rather than 10 days yeah. to collect the data, then it means that you have like nine days, 23 hours and 50 more minutes yeah. to do other stuff. Yeah, completely. And when you have like a project, for example, a student project, which is like bound in time or your yeah. contract, that can make a massive difference. Yeah. Yeah. So a hundred percent. So there, there are, there are, that's, the drivers to do that, the those constraints, they're not scientific ones, right? The constraint of the student has two weeks left to get this data, or they fail their project. That's not really a scientific, you know, that's that's well, not about getting close to the measure. That's about them being able to produce the work in the time available, which is a different constraint. Well, it, that's one way to look at it, but you could also look at the fact that like, if I have more time for other things, I can spend more time, for example, testing. The stuff yeah. that I'm doing, and that could potentially yeah. improve the overall quality. Yeah. So it's it's not that like because you collect data faster, it's better for the data that you collect. But yeah. the fact that you have more time for other things could have, could be beneficial in in general. Completely, and it might. So it, having more time might free you up to think more carefully about some other part of your protocol that you could then improve with the extra time, which would then produce a better scientific output. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So in the paper I talk about, it's we always use these kind of uh, commodity tools. Um, like that's what methods research books are about, right? It's you don't have to start again working out how to do systematic analysis. You go and read a Broad and Clark paper, and then you do what they tell you to do, and then you have a result that other people will accept as being good. And that saves you a lot of time. Because if you were to invent that by scratch, you would never do your research. You would spend all your time trying to work out how a thematic analysis might work. Um, so you definitely can. You, you know, it, 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 it's not, yes, trying to kind of atomize it like that maybe doesn't make, doesn't always make sense. You know, it could free you up elsewhere to do other things. And we always, you know, the computers we used to write our code is, a, you know, we, we never start everything from scratch. We never do anything. Yeah. But it's about interrogating it's not it's not about judging so i've used these tools just to be super clear like i've got lots of data through amazon mechanical, mechanical turk and i was very happy with it um i got publications from it it's not about saying that kind of using these kind of commodity things is good or bad 
the paper is about encouraging you to interrogate why you chose to do it. And if your decision is, well, I chose to do that because I could spend extra time on this other part of the project and it was better for it, that's a completely reasonable rationalization that has maybe maximized the scientific contribution you could make. So it's not about attempting to, you know, say we should all go back to being like cottage industry, people doing everything from scratch. It's not trying to say that. It's trying to say we should interrogate those choices and be prepared to defend defend them on their scientific merits as well. So why, you know, the student did a better project because they could collect the data quickly, that's a reasonable explanation of it. Doing it quickly because I was convinced by their marketing to do it, that's a less defensible, not indefensible because we're human beings, again, but it's a less defensible from a kind of scientific perspective, it's a less defensible rationalization for why you use the platform. And we are susceptible to this kind of marketing. Yeah. And the second comment was about the first two projects that you showed. Can you go back to the review uh, that you showed? Yeah. Too? Sorry, Artie. I, I, I was wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether it, it, there is an issue here of interpretation, which, oh, which is directed to your, to your more general question, right? Yeah. Because when I see this review, I think someone wrote this, 11 21 at night <laughs> put it next to bed here's in themselves for why did i accept to do this review and i do yeah. time and tomorrow i have class and all yeah, yeah. not that anything like that would happen to me but the reviews that are received yeah. i'm sure come from people like that. of course um and so you know here's like when like this is not a wide approach definitely it's not and it's the fact i, I can imagine someone definitely not me mm. writing something like this first and then if i'm lucky enough that the morning after i can look at it again yeah, I think okay, this this sucks. <laughs> so, like, I I would interpret that as something that is more like this approach may not give you yeah very in, in, insights yeah. that are as useful as approaching people who have some experience of it. So, Completely. is it just the way that is written, or is it really the substance? A lot of your analysis seems to focus on you know like the text that you highlighted but yeah is it is that an artifact of how reviews are produced really like looking at a <laughs> so so yeah <laughs> they, 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 absolutely so like again these reviews are not written in some sort of scientific faraday case where there's a perfect rational but we thought this is not even in the top like 20 percent of really rubbish reviews that i've ever received not even close to the top 20 percent um, it's less about saying this is a bad review or whatever. It's just the, the, the point I want to make by bring it in is that sometimes we are fast and loose and there are reasons for that. We're tired, it's late. We accepted this review when we didn't want to. We did it as a favor for the AC who we're friends with and we don't really know anything about it. So we just kind of just stick some stuff down. Um, that's definitely the case. I think what I the reason why I thought it was interesting wanted to bring it up is that if you do try to pass what is written, it, it I, I don't think this is what they meant. I think what they meant is what you said, which is that there will be there are better ways of if you'd done this, you would be in a better way of doing it. Um, but that's not what they said. They said it wasn't valid, and a more valid approach would be to do it their way, which measures a completely different thing. And the reason why I included it is is in, the whole talk's kind of exhortation to think really carefully about measurement. And often we don't have time to do that. And this was an example I felt of, and I've been sufficiently self-critical in the talk, I think that I can say that this is an example of someone who didn't think very hard about what they were saying with regard to measurement. And by being loose with it, they've said something that kind of doesn't make sense. And I've done that with my research as well, just to be really, really clear. So this was part of saying, we, measurement is really important to the work and we should be really careful in how we think about it and, and treat it. And yes, the reason why the review, uh, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll shut up. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Enrico, we'll talk more about it. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. Uh, actually, yeah, when you were presenting this bit, I was, in my mind, I was playing the devil's advocate okay. for our reviewers too. Yeah. And I was thinking, uh, this reviewer must be someone that you know subscribes the positivist or yeah. the more objectivist paradigm of research. Yeah. And in Kai, there are many paradigms. Absolutely, more more interpretivist. Others are more towards objective measurement. Yeah. And I thought this is 
probably someone from human factors that wants to measure. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, he, I think he does have a point okay. because you can actually question if you're actually making a measurement or more interpreting results from a qualitative data. So, you know, if you, if you okay. kind of replace, if you, you know, frame all of that work in a measurement uh, approach, you might question, am I actually measurement anything, uh, measuring anything, or am I, you know, gathering insights from qualitative data, trying to distill, and then interpret on them. And you can really generalize in the same way as you can with uh, a qualitative measurement study. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, excellent. Um, I think the thing that I, when I say measure, I mean it in the, the broadest possible sense of performing an observation. So when I'm using the word measurement in this talk, I'm not talking about attempts to quantify. But measurement is very, very attached to uh, objectivist paradigms of research. And I, you know, I kind of observe both of them and I play with both of them. But Yes. Yeah. No, I think it's a good point. And measurement is maybe a loaded term. What, what did what, you said? Inter interpretation instead. An interpretivist approach relies more on qualitative data in which you can't really use the p-value, but you rely on the insights. You can't make strong generalizations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You, uh, My yes. question is exactly on that, so I think yeah. it can be an answer to so, uh, The concept of measurement, framing what you're doing in approaching qualitative data as yeah. me measurement, I think um, you, you are, you, you do have these epistemological assumptions. I think it relates to your offhand remark that an opinion is a weird firing pattern in the brain. Yeah. A measurement suggests that something has a determinate form. Um, yeah. So when you were talking about the fact that it's useless to have that slider from to measure the subjective experience of difficulty, well, it is if what you think you're trying to do is to um, find a correspondence to the subjective experience of difficulty. Yes. But if what you're doing is scaffolding interpretation um, or reflection on difficulty, then it's perfectly fine to have a slider. So I still think um, j just already saying this is measurement is, 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 is a type of set of epistemological assumptions that are objectivist. Yeah, I mean, so okay. yeah, so my training, I'm a, I'm, my training is psychology, which is like the most positive is even more positivist than phys physics right like they it's the so yes i would accept that that my my training and then my mode of thought is objectivist in nature so i'm more than happy to accept that then i've you know maybe over applied those same ideas that i'm then trying to critique yes it's the, the answer to both your questions is yes very interesting i don't really have a fully formed answer um but I, I, I accept my own uh, my own kind of disposition. I Thank you. Quick. Yes, I, I hope they agree. agree. It's, it's, just, it's written very quickly, but no, they're, they're excellent comments and, and thank you. Sorry for- We're gonna go shut up. upstairs okay. in a second. Sorry. Uh, and have a cup of tea and uh, we can continue the discussion. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.